to the party we've been waiting for you my line was so much better oh wow they just they really just vanish funny line i guess but flash looks genuinely surprised that they're gone and given how he can see everything super slowly that realization makes less sense than ezra miller replacing grant gustin as this character first of all ezra didn't replace grant grant does the tv show dc does this little known thing called being stupid and disconnects their movies from their TV shows when the TV show should be doing the legwork that DC tries to skirt in an attempt at catching Marvel. Second, Flash, as shown in this universe, has to turn on his speed, meaning when he's choosing to move at our speed, he's just a normal dude. He was obviously caught up in what Gordon was saying and got distracted for a moment. The Justice League of ass. I fail to see literally anything wrong with this. Thermal scan shows a cluster of people there. And Alfred couldn't have told them about this until they got all the way to the bottom of the shaft. This collection of words is really sinful. And I mean that in the biblical sense. Right. Uh, is there is there a plan? They just climbed up 60 flights of stairs and had all this time to get over to the harbor. Why didn't they have this discussion until now? Even if we discount Cyborg's isolative demeanor, it's not like Wonder Woman and Bats wouldn't have a dialogue about how to do this mission, right? Dude, who f***ing cares? Why do you waste our time with this stuff? Obviously, the movie addressed the small percentage of audience members that need to know what the plan is in this scene. They just showed a scene where they didn't even know where they would be headed, nor what they would find there. They're not going to show superheroes climbing up a shaft discussing a plan. They do it here when they are where they need to be, because that's how you make movies. This is why you aren't a film creator and why no studio in their right mind wants to pick up the Ables. Except maybe Sony, because they're f***ing idiots. I heard about you. Didn't think you were real. My college girlfriend said the same thing the first time she saw my- Jeremy cut himself off here because he's apparently trying to beat me to the punch. But that's not how we do things here at the Birdman. Yeah, Mossy, Schmaster, from the F. Miss of the Snare Forge. Like my college girlfriend said the same thing. Skip. Oh, I'm really, really missing Superman right now. Because you two were so close. Right, except that's not what he meant because missing doesn't always imply intimate familiarity. Remember, Superman was essentially worshipped on Earth, meaning Flash obviously knew of him and what he was capable of. He only saved the world twice. Also, Jeremy yells at the screen cliche. You die if you don't. No! Cyborg goes full Star-Lord here, and you never go full Star-Lord. Except Star-Lord got everyone snapped, and Cyborg actually saves the people here. <sighs> Amazon. These are my exact words when I see a random ass Camry pull up in my driveway and some stranger Skip. I understand Flash not wanting to get involved, but what's Batman doing while Diana is having the staring contest with Steppenwolf? Assessing the situation and not mindlessly jumping into the fray? You know, like Batman always does? I mean, he is clearly the only one here that isn't a metahuman. You would think you'd give him points for picking his shots. A little quicker! I've got this. Keep moving. The fact that Flash isn't moving all the hostages out of the way by himself isn't the most insulting thing here. It's that he's depending on Cyborg to help, and he's not even using any of his special sh either. He could fly at least a few of these folks to the surface in no time, but he's trudging up the stairs like he's a goddamn tourist at the Arctic Triumph. I have to agree with you here. The fact that the Flash hasn't moved everyone to the surface by himself is already silly, but making Cyborg walk up the stairs with them is nonsensical. The hell was Snyder thinking here? That's like making Superman drive to Las Vegas. Nightcrawler! Thought you'd never ask. Yeah, and why didn't he until now? Probably because the idea was to infiltrate the prison incognito-like. The Nightcrawler isn't exactly quiet, and they weren't trying to alert Steppenwolf to their presence. 
See how he jumps around grabbing the debris? Why didn't he do this earlier with the humans? Again, I agree with the previous sin, but sinning Flash doing Flash things? This is the best part of the scene. No! In the time that Flash had to say no, that mother could have moved that rock, eaten a sandwich, checked the Yankee score, masturbated to completion, and taken a nap, but he needed Cyborg to save the day with a laser blasty save shot. Yep, another idiotic shot by Snyder. He makes Flash, the fastest character in this movie, watch some debris about to fall on a person and yell no, as if he couldn't stop that shit himself. But you had to throw in some nonsensical sexual shit in this sin, so I'm conflicted. Here, I'll ding the ding, but I won't raise the sin count. See? I'm nice. Sure, Diana couldn't kill this bitch with her godlike abilities, but maybe this 50 cal will do the trick. I mean, it's a 50 cal. Step isn't invulnerable, which is why he's blocking his face with his axe. What are we under right now? Gotham Harbor. I love these Q&As that are purely for the audience, even though we were literally told this less than 10 minutes ago. It's like being reminded that Aquaman is good at water, or that Flash is really fast, or that Jesse Eisenberg is a terrible Lex Luthor. Oh, stop. You're the last person to be bitching about questions being answered purely for the audience. I guarantee by the end of this video, you're going to ask a dumbass question that is answered by paying attention. It happens every single video. <laughs> <laughs> You're telling me that in this nine-hour marathon of a movie they couldn't show us how Bruce and company got out of that flood situation just a minute ago? Cyborg flew away from the heroes that were in danger of drowning and the next scene they're just fine? Did the flooding stop for some reason? Is Gotham Harbor empty? <laughs> what the absolute f***ing f***, man? Three sins later and you've already failed the challenge. Jeremy just asked, how did Flash, Wonder Woman, Batman, and Aquaman make it out of a flooding shaft? Wonder Woman can jump really high. Flash and Aquaman should be obvious. Batman just used a grappling hook at the beginning of this set piece. And you want me to believe you were incredulous about the film answering an easy question? <laughs> My lord. Once again, Steppenwolf kneels and snivels and it undercuts this movie's finale, but I guess it does a good job of setting up a future sequel we will never see. What are you not getting about the word hierarchy? How is Steppenwolf, a subordinate of Darkseid, undercut by kneeling to his vastly superior superior. That's like saying Hercules kneeling to Zeus makes Hercules less strong. No, it doesn't. This is how these morons at CinemaSins watch movies. They literally believe that showing respect to a superior makes that person seem weak. No, what this is doing is showing that Darkseid is that dude. Learn how to movie. Find the third box, synchronize the unity, and when this world is scorched, I will come for my great prize. Again with the outsourcing? This is like the most important what's a doodle in the entire universe. Why wouldn't Darkseid be booking a jet blue flight to Earth immediately? Because Darkseid doesn't care about the mother boxes. He wants the anti-life equation. Also, once the mother box create the unity, he can instantly teleport to Earth, as shown at the end of this movie you've already seen. There's a dark spot in my data stream. Look, it happens to men all the time. Sure, you're a little young, but it's never too early for an exam. How do we know you're not working for them? Maybe because he willingly joined you after some trepidation, and he brought you the third mother box and set it on a table between you all and literally asked for help? Red herring is red. That's... Not a red herring at all. In order for something to be a red herring, the movie would have to be trying to fake out the viewer. Arthur is simply asking a question about a dude he just met for the first time, and that question is instantly dispelled because the scene answers that question. I swear you just throw out these terms that you clearly don't understand. Cliché, deus ex machina, intelligence. Crack open a dictionary, Johnny Tsunami. A box has the power to reinstate anterior particle relationships. <laughs> what? What? <laughs> Anterior particles, in this context, are what things become after they have broken down. Due to the first law of thermodynamics, matter cannot be destroyed, only transformed. The problem is that humans don't have the ability to reconstitute matter that has been transformed, such as something that was burned in a fire. What Cyborg is explaining is that the mother box has the capability to restore matter that has been transformed, hence anterior particles. And don't think I forgot about that laugh. Anybody with a match can turn a house to smoke. Uh, citation needed, Wonder Woman. A single match? Try lighting a house on fire with a single match and see how far you get. Especially if it's brick or stucco. I get the point you're trying to make. Then stop, especially because you clearly don't know what you're talking about. Ignoring for the moment that no modern house is made completely of brick, bricks have moisture inside them, which can expand when exposed to the heat of a fire, and voila, destroyed brick house. Who is it? Martha. She could have called, texted, emailed, or sent a letter, but instead, fake Clark's mom showed up right at Lois's door. And more importantly, why did you say that name? So you correctly identify that this is the Martian Manhunter, 
but you also wonder why he didn't send a text or a call? Do you seriously not see the issue with that? Also, why did this alien butthole choose to turn back into his regular form as soon as he got out in the hallway? What if Lois opened the door to get one more hug before Ma Kent left? What if Mrs. Hollingsworth from 5A was just returning home from her grocery run? What if Dick Bickle just got done with his shift at the laundromat and was searching for his keys outside his door? Why turn back into this body at all while you're around humans? I'm always left wondering why you give sense to a film for something that could have, but didn't happen. What would you have done if that did happen? Give them a sin? You see why this is dumb? There are six, not five. There's no us without him. This plan is dumb. They held their own against Steppenwolf under the harbor, and that was without Arthur's help, and they didn't even work together. As Flash pointed out, there wasn't a f***ing plan at all. I know the movie has to properly Justice League, but none of this discussion makes a lick of sense unless they got their asses kicked in the last battle, which they didn't. Jeremy, the same guy that's been bitching about Steppenwolf bowing to Darkseid, has forgotten about Darkseid. In this scene, Batman specifically states that the Mother Boxes didn't awaken until Superman died, meaning they were afraid of Superman and not anyone else here. It's not about them holding their own versus Steppenwolf, which they barely did, by the way. It's about putting pseudo-armor around the world. Remember that? If you can't bring down the charging bull, then don't wave the red cape at it. The f***? The red cape attracts a bull, but... Doesn't, I mean, even the best bullfighter can't guarantee they can bring down the bull because bulls are f***ing unpredictable dicks. And the bullfighter is already in the ring with the bull before they wave the red cape. It's not like the bull is just walking by a stadium full of people minding his own business and suddenly someone appears and waves a red cape which angers the bull and then the competition begins. Way to take a metaphor completely on its face. You probably thought I meant an actual face too. I know I've already given this movie a lot of shit about its length. There's a reason shit gets cut, man. The banter between Flash and Aquaman is pretty amusing, but do we really need to see the entirety of the journey of them moving Clark's body from Smallville to the ship? No, viewer. No, we do not. Then watch the Whedon cut. It's not like this movie wasn't asked for by the fans or anything. I mean, you sat down to watch a director's cut and are complaining about it being a director's cut. Even the Dark Knight didn't make their skyline as Chicago-y as this, and that shit was Chicago as fuck. And also, isn't this Metropolis, not Gotham? Is every big city in the DCEU based on Chicago? I'm not even sure you know what you're trying to say here. But one thing I'd like to point out is that you're doing to DC what you do to Marvel. Conflation of universes. Just like Blade and the Fantastic Four aren't MCU movies, The Dark Knight isn't a DCEU movie. So regardless if this scene set in Metropolis was filmed in the murder capital where they murder for capital, The Dark Knight being filmed there has nothing to do with anything. The f*** is everyone looking at? There was supposedly a microbial leak or something that led to the civilian evacuation, so why would they think anything big would be happening in the research station? Do, do they expect Superman to come back to life? Have they all read this far into the script? Probably because these military personnel are here creating a perimeter. If you know anything about rubbernecking, it's that people are always in my way in traffic. But, I mean, people are nosy. You two lunatics better know what you're doing. Two lunatics? As I recall, this is everyone's plan. And I'm pretty sure Arthur signed off on this sh too. And I recall every line Arthur had during that scene being skeptical. The box brought Victor back. Victor wasn't dead. Life is either one or zero. It's to be or not to be. Not both. Even if Superman could return, who's to say that he could defeat them? How the f*** do they know what they are doing? Is there an Ikea-like instruction booklet for reviving a super person? Yes, this guy. I don't understand why Flash has to run fast and time things when Cyborg is here and he should easily be able to create the charge needed and time it perfectly. But we needed a tense scene and many people in the comments will be happy to explain why I'm wrong, but the movie doesn't really explain it, so therefore I'm right. You have tried to create a set of impossible parameters that the movie cannot meet and then erroneously declare yourself right. Unfortunately for you, I exist. Your suggestion that Cyborg should be able to create the charge is the false portion of this premise. Even with the vast array of Victor's abilities, he has never been shown to generate an electrical charge. You seem to think all energy is functional energy. Chewed up food is energy, but you can't power a PC monitor with it, nor could you set your iPhone on fire and expect it to work, even though fire is energy. Do you see how you need the appropriate source of energy to power something? The movie explicitly states that capacitors are involved here, meaning electrical energy is needed, also meaning you're not right. So wait, Cyborg is getting information about the future from touching a computer? Barry is unwittingly giving Victor access to the Speed Force, which is allowing him to see the future. The same thing happened to Bruce in BVS when Barry tries to visit the past to warn Batman that Darkseid was coming. It's fairly vague, I'll give you that, but it's consistent with what we've already seen. 
The lasso, it does nothing! Except it does, because as was shown in Wonder Woman 1984, the lasso, in addition to forcing you to tell the truth, can also reveal the truth to someone. You should know that because you already made a video on that movie. kal the last son of Krypton. Yeah, the lasso and all the fighting didn't do the trick. Let's try words. Again, Jeremy is pretending he didn't see Wonder Woman 2, a movie he did a video on five months ago. Look, I know Batman is way slower than the other superheroes, but the research facility isn't that far away. He has grappling hooks that can swing him around like f***ing Spider-Man. He could have caught a ride with Flash, or he could have just boosted one of the cars nearby. The question remains, why the balls did it take him so long to get here? You've manipulated this scene. Batman was already here during most of the fight with the Justice League. He is slower than everyone else, so he got here last, but you're making it seem as if he got here after everyone had already gotten taken out, and that's just not true. If you don't believe me, fire up your HBO Max and watch the scene for yourself. Clark, no. First off, not to beat a dead horse, but why doesn't he just say Martha? Because Batman was the one affected by the name Martha. I get that you thought this was clever, but you've got the meme backwards, my dude, especially since Superman doesn't remember anything but faces, and he barely remembers those. I mean, otherwise, he wouldn't be here attacking Wonder Woman and Bats, because the last time he saw them, they were all friends. A power of love is the curious thing. Make a Superman weep, had a Batman sting. Jeremy sings in a video cliche. How can the same guy bring about the end of the Earth in two different franchises? I'm pretty sure Miles Dyson wasn't the reason this mother box called to Steppenwolf. That was the Justice League. Aren't you watching the movie that you're watching? Holy shit, I can actually see the color blue in Batman's suit. Slap my ass and call me Susan, I'm taking a sin off. Ah, Kelly Clarkson! Susan makes a 40-year-old virgin pop culture reference that isn't a sin of the movie cliche. I have a second chance, Lo. Has Clark always called her Lo? I have to be honest, I've watched Man of Steel, Batman v Superman, both versions, and both versions of this movie multiple times, and I swear to f*** that I've never heard him use this nickname. So? What the hell is even this sin? The movie is establishing, right now, that he does refer to her in this manner. You don't see their every waking moment together in those films, so obviously this is something he calls her in those moments. Barry Allen was right here. Flashing back to the Flash in a flashback without actually flashing to the flashback. Aw, look at that. Jeremy pretending he wants to see a flashback in a movie he's been complaining about the length of. Nigga, please. I know these assholes are superheroes and shit, but is there a reason to take off before the fucking back hatch is closed? No one's had a chance to even sit down, let alone get buckled in. Surely you're not asking if the super strong cyborg, Wonder Woman, and Aquaman are being affected by the tiny amount of G-forces here and are clearly referring to the human Batman, right? I mean, it's not like Batman has near-perfect balance or anything. It's not like he's been shown to be able to fight a ton of bad guys while balancing on a log that was in the water, right? <laughs> huh. How about that? My redemption is thy. Premature celebration. Celebration implies that he believes his work is finished, but the word nigh means almost. He's saying he's almost achieved redemption, which is true, so it's not premature. Superman needs the sun, gives him a boner for the fight to come. Jeremy sings boner in a video, cliche. Well, that was easy. If Independence Day, Minecraft, and the Star Wars movies have taught me anything, that sh should be pretty hard to do. None of those guys have a Batman. Just saying. Oh man, these parademons totally have Stormtrooper aim, huh? <laughs> if they're having this much trouble with the Batmobile, there's no way one of them would be able to later hit a target as fast as Flash, especially when he's almost at full speed, right? <laughs> these guys are f***ed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I get what you're implying. The problem is that the Flash was running so fast that he was basically easy to hit. Think about it, if you're running laps as fast as the Flash, you'd be in all spaces at all times. You'd be a literal ring. The real sin is that they missed a few times. Eh, don't think I forgot about that laugh. Wonder Woman and Flash show up to save Batman's ass here. That's all well and good, but they still don't even know Superman is coming to bail them out, so this is poor allocation of resources. By this point in the scene, they haven't made it inside where the dome used to be yet, so saving Batman is part of the success of the team. I mean, if you lose your strategist, your plan is mostly dead on arrival. Shit, Cyborg is here too? They left Steppenwolf all alone with Aquaman? The Justice League are dicks. And here's the reason I covered the previous sin. CinemaSins is manipulating the movie again. Aquaman is out here fighting the Parademons too. No one has yet gone inside where Steppenwolf is, and Jeremy knows this. He is lying to you. I do not understand why CinemaSins does this, but this is pure dishonesty. You're welcome, a man. 
No booyah? I'd remove a sin, except I still remember the booyah from the theatrical version, so... And here, Jeremy is literally showing a scene of Aquaman not inside with Steppenwolf, and he's totally ignoring that he just said the opposite. Now Batman is shooting fools with a f***ing alien heavy machine gun, and are any of these f***ing characters doing what they're known for doing in this f***ing final battle? Oh? You mean like, right now? Where Batman will use whatever is available to take on an enemy? Jeremy doesn't know shit about comics. Tell me, Amazon. Why did you abandon your own sisters? I know villains got a villain and shit, but is this really relevant right now? Well, if you would have let the actual scene play, you would have understood how it was relevant. Why did you abandon your own sisters, only to cast your lot with these creatures clinging to their puny lives? You went there to protect them from me, and sadly you could have. Hey, it's a literal deus ex machina. It's a literal deity in the machine? You know, because that's what deus ex machina literally means, meaning of course you have no clue what you're talking about and just misuse and dumb down words. Also, wow, Superman? You don't f***ing say. I had him written off back when he was standoffish to the heroes after being reborn. No way I thought he was going to show up here at the end to save the day. That's ludicrous. Who in their right mind would have predicted that? then it's a wonder you're referring to it as a deus ex machina, considering you and everyone else already knew Superman was going to show up here. And no, I'm not even talking about knowing this because of the Whedon cut. I'm including that movie here. There's an entire plot thread in both these films surrounding them resurrecting Superman so he can help defeat Steppenwolf. That is the antithesis of a deus ex machina, because in order for something to be a deus ex machina, the plot resolution has to come from nowhere and not be set up prior. Get it? If Superman randomly showed up after being dead and the movie never once hinted at him being resurrected, that would be a deus ex machina. How the f*** are you a writer? Why did Darkseid show up now? I thought he needed to be informed about the unity after it happened. Then he would come to Earth and do his evil sh**. The boxes haven't even been synchronized yet. Another scene manipulation. This portal is open because the boxes do become synchronized in this scene. You're presenting this as if Darkseid is pulling up a chair and drinking coffee while the League struggles with the parademons or something. The synchronization happens literally 20 seconds after first seeing Darkseid on screen. Go on, check. The guy who runs really fast will now run so fast he is running through space, but we will present that exceptional speed via slow motion, because p Sending this scene for literally any reason other than Barry's goofy-ass running style. You gotta hand it to Victor. He's got academic pride out the ass. Anytime he's not cyborg, he's in some sort of letter jacket or Gotham City University swag. The Alumni Association should be constantly hitting him up after this. This is because this jacket is the last thing Victor was wearing when he was fully human. Hyper-observant my ass. Thank you is not enough what you did. I did a mistake. Jesus, Ball's on fire with a desire to get the f away from this leaden exposition. He did a thing. You're thankful. You're both super privileged white people. Let's go already. Superman is not white. He's Kryptonian, like literally from another planet. Just because he is fair-skinned doesn't make him white. I mean, if that's the case, what are these people? If you answered black, congratulations. Isn't that right? Batman. No context or justification here. CinemaSense just gives 30 cents to the film for this scene, so I have to assume they don't like this Joker, which, granted, Jared isn't the best. However, this scene redeemed his Joker in my estimation, and while he is no Ledger, Nicholson, or even Phoenix, this is a Joker I want to see more of. Ah, it was all a dream! The movie's ending on an it was all a dream cliche. Wow. Not that the whole movie was a dream, but the unnecessary six minute desert future nightmare sequence was a dream. Which means it means nothing, since this is at the end of the fucking movie! Jeremy is upset that a sequence called Nightmare was a dream. Jesus, why is there so much Marvel in this DC logo? If it wasn't obvious before, Jeremy and his writers seem to have run out of material and are just saying things that they've already said in other videos. I mean, this is the same sin from the Justice League video. Lazy much? Also, this is the first of many Marvel references throughout this video, so he's going to get 10 sins every time he makes one. He went out to fix his shutters in the pouring rain. What he couldn't predict was that he'd fall in love. Okay, since my critics love to tell me that CinemaSins is satire, what about this is satirical? Where's the commentary on this film here? Or is this just a lame attempt at Screen Junkies? Wait a minute, didn't Jeremy bitch and moan that Screen Junkies stole my idea? You hypocrite. So, uh, who are you? Atlanta, Queen of Atlantis. 
I'm Tom, keeper of Lighthouse. This just goes to show that men will go along with any crazy sh** if the woman is hot enough. But does this really prove that trope, considering she's telling the truth? And, you know, threw a goddamn trident into a TV? The Lighthouse is his erect penis. Jeremy defines boner. Also, movie sure did yada yada Atlanta's whole integration into human society, huh? I know they're in love and shit, but Thomas just accepted her entire backstory about underwater royalty? So, you're sending this same exact concept for a second time? Not to mention you just stated that they're in love. At this point, her backstory doesn't matter to him. I mean, I love bacon and I don't give a shit about its backstory. <laughs> Sorry, vegans. And my father found the love of his life. Well, as long as two completely different species can mate successfully, what's the harm? In the film, Atlanteans and humans are cousins, meaning that hybridization is technically possible. Think horses and zebras. I mean, don't you know all about cousins and love? Legend has it that one day a new king will come. Nursery rhymes position. Oh, for f**k's sake. All things considered, this is a pretty badass action scene. It definitely plays with special effects to make Moulin Rouge look like a bona fide action star, but I'll take this over the f**k you, we're Marvel. Mentioning Marvel in a DC film cliche. Fake fish! Fake fish! Fake fish! Hold me back, future bird man. Hold me back. Being honest, how many people at the aquarium actually saw Arthur's eyes turn yellow there? From this distance, maybe one or two. But certainly not enough to get a collective gasp, right? And why didn't government agencies immediately descend to study the magical talking shark boy? The people aren't reacting to Arthur's eyes. If you look really closely, you might see that there's a giant collection of aquatic animals congregating behind him. I won't tell you how to captain, and you don't tell me how to pirate. <laughs> what was the point of keeping this asshole alive, if not specifically so that Kane can announce himself as a pirate? Wait, what was that? What was the point of keeping this asshole alive? One more time. What was the point of... What was the... What was the... What was the... <laughs> Have these pirates never actually pirated before? Sure, Aquaman's a badass, but if they attacked him in any other way than this bull there's no way he'd be winning this fight. What the hell? In what other way could guys with guns attack Aquaman here? No, seriously, what the f are you asking for? Hey, movie, get your Zack Snyder out of my James Wan. Also, Aquaman survives this. I guess he is impervious to bullets even though Justice League didn't tell us that. But this was a direct hit from one of those big guns, like what took out the T-1000, damn it. Why wouldn't Aquaman survive this? His durability is damn near Superman level, what with being able to withstand the immense pressures of the ocean and all. Also, the T-1000 wasn't killed by a noob tube, he was melted. That's not me. Oh, you're doing it, aren't you? How does Thomas not know this? This is after Justice League, so the entire world saw them resurrect, then fight Superman in Metropolis. I'm sorry, what? The entire world saw Superman in Justice League, you say? The entire world? You that fish boy from the TV? These guys just want a picture, and it subverts the dumbasses in a bar pick a fight with the metahuman trope we've seen time and again. But who the f*** asks for a picture this way? Jeremy answers his own question cliche. Oh cool, they're all arriving for this year's Triwizard Cup. Jeremy makes a Harry Potter ref- The f*** would actually make that noise? And in water, how does the noise issue even work down here? It's not even like Justice League where Pineapple Express made an air bubble for and Arthur to talk. They're just in the f***ing water. Sound actually travels better through water than it does through air. Seriously, if you're in front of a sperm whale while it's using its sonar, you will f***ing die. Volko has learned of the location of the lost trident of Atlan. With the sacred trident, the people will listen to you. But supreme executive power derives from a mandate from the masses, not so- Skip! Unprecedented sights from all over the world today. All over the world? How does Orm have that much reach? I get that he can pull some shit in the Atlantic, but is he going to, like, Peru? Mumbai? Djibouti? You're aware that Atlanteans have the ability to control the ocean, and that the ocean is all over the world, right? Right? Why is this jump necessary? They could jump into any area of the water and swim to Atlantis, but they choose the one where jumping into the jagged rocks below is a possibility. And it wouldn't matter, because Atlanteans are extremely durable. Dude, this is basically Superman underwater. I hit my ship in here. What do you need a ship for? Both of you are ships. They need ships for the very reasons humans need cars, boats, and planes. More efficient travel over large distances. Your fish ship has been marinating in chum butter. Weird, this is the same thing I said to my college girlfriend after the first time we had sex with Anaconda. In the long list of disgusting things you've said over the years, this takes the f***ing cake. Oh, sh there's a Bifrost underwater now? I can't wait until Thor dukes it out with Aquaman for the throne of sexiest comic book character alive. 
Jeremy makes a Marvel ref. We use this air pocket as an extra layer of precaution. Only the highborns can breathe water as well as air. I can guarantee you there is at least one Ethan Hawke and Gattaca type that can breathe air and would if it weren't for his asshole father. What even is this bullshit? Because for a century, they have polluted our waters. Hey, humans have been polluting the water for much longer than a century. Hey, smartass. This is a reference to the Industrial Revolution, which is generally understood to have been in full swing in the 1840s, meaning a minimum of 178 years. There also weren't measurable amounts of oceanic dumping until the early to mid-1900s, shrinking that 178 years to a minimum of 68 years and a maximum of 118 years. For a century is being used correctly here. But if I win, you're over. Still. Awesome. It's not like I didn't see a much better version of this pissing contest earlier in the year in Black Panther. Mentioning Marvel Ex Machina. Will you escort my betrothed to the royal box? Doesn't she already have the royal box, though? <sighs> wow, how did the Atlanteans get Neil Peart down here? Sinning Neil Peart. This movie is literally playing a hip-hop cover of Toto's Africa as we pan over the Saharan desert, and I think my brain just officially curdled. Fuck you, that was one of the best parts of the movie. Look, movie, if you're gonna make a big deal out of Mira practically vomiting because she's never been up this high before, then you can't make her fearlessly jump out of a goddamn airplane without any reservations. And I know it's sand they're about to jump into, but now I've gotta ask, what exactly would kill these two if not this fall? Dude, what are you not getting about Atlanteans being super durable? And air sickness is the result of her eardrum sending her brain conflicting signals due to this being her first time in a plane. Oops, major hologram faux pas there, Manta. One time, Obi-Wan did that to Yoda, and Yoda nearly ended that motherfucker. I can't for the life of me figure out what the hell Jeremy is talking about here. Converts water into beams of energized plasma. So, a super soaker? What universe do you live in where super soakers shoot plasma? Cause it ain't this one. I guess Manta's got a Manta, but isn't Kane a f***ing pirate? This montage makes him look like goddamn Tony Stark when he's been shown to be a competent but very straightforward thief. We only got one scene with him earlier. They haven't been able to establish anything yet. But this is the movie, right now, establishing that he's competent at building his own tech. Now we are stranded. <laughs> so just like that, eh? He just fell down into the secret world in the middle of the desert buried by mountains of sand. Please stop manipulating scenes to fool your gullible audience. The scene prior to this is Mira using a tracker to get to this exact spot. It's completely dried out. Well, look, sometimes it takes a little while to get things going. Try some more forced pseudo-romantic banter to see if that helps. Okay, dude. Stop. You've been cringy this entire video. We get it. You want to prove you've had sex before. Welcome to puberty. What are you doing? We need water. You need the closest source. Now hold still. Um, can't they just pee on it? Do they pee? You would think they pee. Could have just peed on it. You see? No, seriously, this one tiny fucking drop of flop sweat powers this entire thing that previously had to be underwater to work. You should have peed on it! So you're stealing jokes from the movie you're trying to sin. Okay, Amy Schumer, tell me this. If a bead of sweat worked, why should they have peed on it? To get the exact result they already did? Genius! What did you just say? Something, something, try it. Is Aquaman supposed to be dumb? I know he's quippy and he drinks a lot, but he seems like he's able to process information pretty well. But in the last few scenes, he's gone completely meathead. CinemaSins describes CinemaSins. Marcus Agrippe. He was a great general, but he wasn't a king. See, he's not stupid, and movie cannot make up its mind if it wants to be consistent or squeeze a cheap laugh out of the audience. Dude, this is the film showing that Arthur has a devil-may-care attitude towards things and that he is growing into the king he will one day be, a.k.a. the hero's journey. None of these guys are kings except this guy, Romulus. Why the f*** did the Atlanteans consider Romulus a true king? And isn't the Aquaman story steeped in Greek mythology? Doesn't the whole Atlantis mythology come from Plato? But even more important, why would they use human kings as a guide for their trident hunt? Romulus was the first king of Rome, probably the most historically significant dynasty ever. Second, this is a comic book film. The elements can be whatever the writers of the books wanted them to be. God damn it, stop with the surprise explosions movie. Till you learn your lesson, I'm assigning you 10 cents. When is an explosion not a surprise, Jeremy? Go on, tell me. <laughs> I know this is a classic villain outfit, and there was an actual reason given about why the helmet is so big, but holy bejesus, this looks so stupid. <laughs> Jeremy thinks the badass, damn near comic accurate Black Manta costume looks stupid. I think I speak for the entire comic book community when I say, Fuck you. Also, by the way, there are no tourists at this extremely touristy part of Sicily, especially on this beautiful day. Oh my god, stop fucking lying. Call me Black Manta. 
<laughs> um, did you just say Black Panther? Oh, 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 you said Black Manta. Okay, you're right. Totally different. I had Marvel's lawyers on the line there for a second. Marvel! How'd you find me? Your lady friend has people who like to keep tabs on her. Why bother even telling him this sh even if you're sure you're going to kill Aquaman? If you were paying attention, you may have noticed that Black Manta was stalling in order to lock onto his target. Ah! We've seen Aquaman get full blasted by Black Manta in this movie and he didn't die. Now we're supposed to worry when he falls off a building and hits a bunch of stuff on the way to the ground? What can actually kill him? This is the Superman problem, only worse because his powers have never been defined. Welcome to why the books fucking matter. If you want to be a pedantic asshole and not accept that the movie is showing you that he is extremely durable, yet can be harmed by Black Manta's technology, then your only other reference would be the comics which these characters are based on. And to suggest that his powers haven't been defined is a flat-out lie. We've seen him demonstrate superhuman strength, speed, durability, the ability to breathe and communicate underwater, the ability to communicate with sea life. The from the depths, the scan of the life! We interrupt this Aquaman movie to bring you a very special presentation of Pitch Black. Jeremy makes a pop culture reference that isn't a sin of the film cliche. So that flare's just gonna work underwater, huh? Don't underwater flares require some sort of hose that supplies oxygen, a bubble around the flame, and other science facts? And this is why simply asking questions doesn't count as sins. Flares clearly work underwater due to the magnesium and strontium nitrate they burn, which is also the reason for the bright red color of the flame. Meanwhile, Joe Musial fires up a magnesium torch. Magnesium burns so hot that water can't extinguish the flame, and the reaction releases oxygen from the water needed to support the combustion. <laughs> they totally Michelle Pfeiffer and Nicole Kidman to the DC version of the Quantum Realm, didn't they? You know, for a DC fan, you sure can't keep Marvel's D out of your M. Seriously, why the bullshit quest if Arthur was the only one who could pull the sword from the stone? Or, I mean, Trident from the Atlan? You could've stuck this thing in the middle of Atlantis' town square and saved time. The reason Arthur was the only one that could take the Trident was literally because he has the ability to speak to sea life. Arthur's transformation into king will be brought to you by random pictures of aquatic sea life. The Luc Besson who directed Lucy will be extremely happy. Nothing about this is random. This scene is trying to tell you that Aquaman now has the ability to command all sea life. I'd remove 85,000 sins if either Mera or Atlanta said, so did you get the Trident? So you like when people ask obviously stupid questions to things that are easily answered by just looking? You should watch Cinema Sins. I hear they do that a lot. Oh man, I bet these battle crustaceans are delicious if they've been living in a brine all these years. Jeremy sends something he likes cliche. Yeah, but he's killing a f ton of the innocent army, right? I know they started it but all he's really here for is Orm, so he should just be going after him. What's he even need this big angry Kraken thing for anyway? These types of sins are really hard to write for. I mean, he's asking random questions thinking they have anything to do with each other and then sending the film for that. Seriously, what the hell does him killing an innocent army have to do with what does he need the Kraken for? That's like me saying, oh, I feel like eating a jelly sandwich, but why do hurricanes affect Florida so often? Ding. Oh man, they're totally about to fishbone, aren't they? Jeremy says fishboner. The giant war crocodile gets ever closer to Aquaman, and he wedges a trident in its jaws to stop him from eating it. But he can talk to this crocodile, right? No need for the trident theatrics. That's not a crocodile, it's a mosasaurus. I am Aquaman. Seems like you could have come up with something cooler than that, but we'll go along with it, I guess. Pretty sure they've been calling him Aquaman before this movie. And for a guy with two first names, do you think you have any right to be making fun of someone's name? The Warner Brothers logo, the dark and stormy night imagery, the sweeping score, the pan down to a snowy road. Are we sure this isn't a Harry Potter movie? I admit, I am impressed that you didn't begin this video saying, However, this is the beginning of like a million pop culture references in this video, and as this is EU CinemaSins, Jeremy makes a pop culture ref- You can't go crying to other people all the time. A man needs to know when to stand up for himself. Toxic masculine paternity. Oh, f off with these garbage fake SJW talking points. Stating that a man needs to know when to stand up for himself is in no way toxic. Literally, swap the genders and your commentary would be deemed sexist. It's a caterpillar, which must mean something, because in the theater, I swear I heard the sound of at least a dozen comic book boners launching simultaneously. This caterpillar is Mr. Mind, a worm from Venus with a genius level intellect and one of Captain Marvel's most dangerous enemies. I would have thought you were more familiar with this particular villain, considering he should be an inspiration for you. You know, because he's a two inch worm that can do a lot of damage. Also, Jeremy says boner. I am the last of the Council of Wizards. God damn it, I wrote a whole sin about how Jaimon Hansu was double dipping in Marvel and DC, and that he was probably the only one to have done that, only to realize like a million actors and actresses have done that. 
Halle Berry was Storm and Catwoman, so for making me think about Catwoman, somehow this movie gets a sin. So this movie gets a sin because Catwoman was bad. Cinema sins, ladies and gentlemen. He lies. Don't be his champion. We can give you power. When the Shazamily forefathers put this throne room together, who decided it was a good idea to design the apparently still conscious and active embodiments of evil as part of the main hallway decor? Uh, Shazam? I mean, it's quite obvious that once Shazam captured the enemies of man, he wanted them in an area that he could keep an eye on them. No! Jesus, Shazam, last minute much? If Thaddeus weren't so goddamn painfully slow at grabbing his balls, you'd be sh out of luck. This was a test for Savannah, meaning Shazam wanted to see if he'd go for it. Besides, are you suggesting that you're fast at grabbing balls? You will never be worthy. Thanks, asshole. I mean, old Shazam brought Thaddeus here with no context, exposited a tiny bit, and now he insults him for not being a good enough Neo Shazam? As I just explained, Shazam was testing Savannah, meaning that after he'd shown that he was unable to resist being tempted by the enemies of man, he was no longer deemed worthy. You're gonna be okay. You did this. Damn, this family is so committed to shaming this f***ing kid that the dickhead older brother would rather do that than look for help for his dying dickhead dad. Dying? Okay, dude, you said a few sins ago that you saw this movie in the theaters, so you know his dad isn't dying here and is only paralyzed. So this is Jeremy Fane's ignorance cliche. Or how I learned to stop worrying and love Captain Marvel. You already made this Doctor Strange love pop culture reference in the Bumblebee video. Running out of material there? Open this up right now, kid! Very good, very funny! Man, these are some tolerant ass cops. Billy lured them into what could be a dangerous crime scene, locked them in a pawn shop, and commandeered their cruiser. I know his motives are benign, but the cops don't know that What are you trying to say here? That the cops should just pull out their guns and blast the kid because he pulled a fast one on them? The NRA would love you. Also, is this seriously the only way he can track down another Batson? This is 2019, man. Everyone's findable. You seriously don't think Billy's mom has a f***ing Instagram account? Jeremy thinks you can find a person's exact location using Instagram. But I wanted a tiger. Oh, but this is the real prize, baby. You can use that your whole life. You'll always find your way. Movie steals the give a compass as a gift move from Big. And really, a lot of from Big, right? Captain Marvel debuted in the comics in 1939, which means the character precedes Big by 49 years. That's what happens when you suck! Direct video feed of me editing CinemaSins videos somehow makes it into the movie. Funny. And here I thought this was a scene of me writing for this video. It's the, uh, the old Batarang. Feel how sharp. Okay, this world obviously exists in the DC Universe since Batman, Superman, and Wonder Woman are all featured here. But if that's the case, then why set this in a real-ass city like Philly? If Gotham and Metropolis exist, where the hell are they located? On the I-95 corridor? As I already explained in the Murder Man vs. Boring Man video, Gotham and Metropolis are located in New Jersey and Delaware, respectively. Real cities obviously exist in DC. And speaking of DC, in that same movie, Superman went to court in Washington, DC. Also, I do have to take a sin off for Vincent and Rosa here, who are great models of actual foster parents that care. There are so many f***ing depictions of awfulness from foster kids in movies that this is a breath of fresh air. Agreed. He call himself a wizard, even just like a, a wizard from Harry Potter. Wait, wait, wait. Harry Potter also exists in the same universe as Superman and the other metahumans? Meaning that in this movie's world, J.K. Rowling said, You know what? There's not enough of a sense of mysticism and wonder around me. I think I'll invent a wizard and a magical school that people can read and escape to a new world, instead of literally looking out their windows and seeing an alien flying around saving people. I'll even include broomsticks. Well, this is dumb because J.K. Rowling began writing Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone in 1990 and finished the novel in 1995. It was published in 1997, and since Superman didn't learn how to fly until roughly 2013, this means that Harry Potter had been a thing at least 16 years before superheroes were. And no, we're not counting Wonder Woman because her existence wasn't mainstream yet. Recurrent imagery has proven very common in cases of mass hysteria. I've heard about people seeing cats and dogs living together. Jeremy makes a Ghostbusters pop culture reference that isn't a sin of the film cliche. Also, sin ball! That's a ball of sins, man! How do I not have a replica of this on my kitchen table? Jeremy sins something he likes cliche. That's the way! Dude, what is up with the over-the-top dickwads in this movie? I thought Thaddeus' family was bad, but these motherfuckers are so into assholery that they've abandoned their truck in the school parking lot just to track Billy down to the f***ing subway. Are people extra dickish in Philadelphia? Wait, I think I just answered my own question. CinemaSins watches The Birdman. He used his powerful revenge, releasing the seven deadly sins into your world. That's a real shame and all, but when did this happen? Were people not sinning at all to that point? Or 
they're just not deadly sinning. I'm sinning the fact that these sinners weren't previously sinny enough, and that's that. The Shazam comics borrow elements from the Christian and Greek mythologies. Specifically in Christian mythology, sin didn't exist until the fall of man. Combining these elements, Black Adam releasing the sins represents the fall of man, which precludes a period of time where humans were altruistic. Millions of lives were lost. Well, I'm sure wrath and envy were pretty rough to deal with, but did lust and pride really take a f ton of people out? And if so, was it really all that bad? Well, lust and pride are bad because they can cause people to experience the other sins. For example, if you are proud and someone that you perceive to be better than you shows up, you'll then experience envy and perhaps even wrath. Lust can also cause one to feel envy and so on. The wisdom of Solomon, the strength of Hercules. Blah blah A for Atlas, blah blah Z for Zeus. Get it? It's an acronym. Many people don't know this, but Jeremy is also an acronym for all my powers. The good looks of Jim Neighbors. Skip! Come on, man, this is public goddamn transit. A dude in a superhero costume wouldn't cause anyone to bat a f***ing eyelash. That's so common, ironically enough, I wrote a very similar sin in Captain Marvel. Yes. As noted earlier, you are running out of material. And as I noted in the Captain Marvel video, these people completely stand out. I mean, Billy is wearing a bright red Play-Doh outfit for f**k's sake. Within the first few minutes of trying to figure out his superpower, Shazam encounters a mugging and an armed robbery. Either Philadelphia's got a Gotham-level crime problem, or this movie has a DCEU-level convenience problem. Or maybe both. I mean, this is Philadelphia. Shoot him in the face! Shoot me in the face! In the face? Okay, Billy trying to figure out his powers was fun earlier, but this is just dumb. From the risks they immediately take, to the number of bullets the thugs have, to the complicity of these assholes being willing to commit murder in the service of knocking off one convenience store, it's so dumb for a pretty smart movie. So let me get this straight. You honestly believe it's dumb that criminals who brought loaded guns to a convenience store they planned on robbing were willing to commit murder? What the hell did you think the guns were for? I totally get why Rocky was training so hard to get up here. Jesus Christ, this movie has more winking pop culture references than an episode of CinemaSins. CinemaSins would be excellent at The Birdman. Also, it's pretty impressive that they're able to have this conversation all alone at the top of a huge tourist attraction with a big-ass Christmas tree on it. Is it really that late at night? I mean, yeah. If you were actually doing your job, you'd have heard Billy tell Freddy this. It's Billy! You asked me. Flight or invisibility. I thought that was stupid, but now I look like this and I need your help. Meet me back here after lights out. Then, after they meet, Freddy shows his phone indicating that it is 11.30 p.m. before they head to the convenience store. So one can assume it's sometime after 12 a.m. when they're sitting on these steps. Dude, I thought you were Cinema Sins. Oh, brother. Thank God Thad identified his brother by name, or I'd have completely lost the context of this relationship. He did not identify his brother by name here. He actually said his brother's name before that. Now I have proof. That's enough, Thad. Dear Sid. This to me indicates that you were lost in this context and attempted to manipulate the scene to pretend the film did otherwise for your stupid ass audience. Unfortunately for you, I exist. Hey kids, wanna go see the super fun movie where a kid gets superpowers and also nightmare creatures eat the heads off people? Don't worry, we won't show you any boobs, so you'll be fine. Sign the MPAA. Once again, just because a film is about comic book heroes doesn't mean that it's for kids. This film was rated PG-13 in the US and Goobly Shanks or whatever wacky name the British use for movie ratings. Listen, the last thing we need is a remake of The Mist. I loved it, but that devastated me. It's at this point that I put a delicious hint of lime Tostito in my mouth and go... You patting the sink out, bro? Oh my god! I don't think that's gonna buff out. Not that I'm rooting for anything to happen to Freddy, but these two dick had massive bully boners yesterday, and now Freddy gets this close to him, insults them, and they do nothing? It's called shock, Jeremy. Like my reaction to you saying dick fucks and bully boners in the same sentence. I'm so sorry I'm late. I got held up at the business office doing all the work stuff. <laughs> Why the hell did it take DC this f***ing long to make a funny movie? Damn it, I really want to remove a sin here. But it took so long for DC to make a funny movie. And the Lego Batman movie is a whole different thing, so that doesn't count. Jeremy sends something he likes and does his fake f***ing laugh. And in the event you don't believe this is a fake laugh, here's a Reddit post of Jeremy admitting his laughs are always fake. Also, but it took so long for DC to make a funny movie. And the Lego Batman movie is a whole different thing, so that doesn't count. So this is exactly what I've been saying for the longest time. This reasoning is precisely why movies like Blade or Logan aren't Marvel movies. You see, you can have a character from a comic book and not call it a DC or Marvel movie. If it's not made by Marvel Studios, it ain't a Marvel movie. Otherwise, Lego Batman and even Hollywood Land are both DC movies. Har 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 movie. Seriously, Freddy's actively trying to kill Billy. Okay, 
How else would you test the limits and abilities of a superhero? No, seriously. Blatant f***ing theft. Like, I don't know exactly how old they are, but they're definitely... I shouldn't use my magical superpowers to steal from a f***ing bank years old. I gotta be honest with you. Every single time I fantasize about having superpowers, my first thought was literally to rob a bank. Spider-Man proved that even though you've got amazing powers, you can still be a broke ass. Wait, is this supposed to be the same day as they left school? So they went all the way to the warehouse, did the entire training montage, uploaded all those videos to YouTube, jumped into the building, traveled to the mall to hang out for a while, went to the titty twister, robbed the ATM, then bought all this sh and installed it all before they even head to the real estate office? Well, considering Freddy is clearly wearing different clothing, no, this isn't supposed to be the same day. Cinema Sins? Costume stupid. Big white cape like he's getting married or something. Wait, what? Are wedding capes a thing? I caught because I wanted to go with ascots instead of bow ties. And I could have worn a cape? Jesus Christ, Jeremy. He's referring to the wedding gown women wear. Put two and two together for fuck's sake. You gotta look out for you and get as far away from this place as you can. Shazam splaining. Using the term mansplaining in another Captain Marvel movie. So it seems Philadelphia has gotten an early Christmas present in the form of its very own superhero. Why isn't this a bigger deal? Like when Batman and Superman were running around their towns, they were surrounded by the press. But Shazam saves a city bus and they only send one f***ing reporter? It's probably because ever since the reveal of Flash, Aquaman, Batman, Superman, and Wonder Woman, superheroes aren't really that big a deal. These shopping bags are such obvious CG, and I totally noticed this and figured that out on my own. What kind of bullshit is this? Oh, I know. Pointing things out on the screen, cliche. I let go, but it was by accident. I, I saw you. What? Jesus Christ, this origin story is worse than all the times Bruce Wayne's parents were killed combined. Setting aside how creepily young Marilyn was when she had Billy, she's describing her abandonment of him in the middle of a public place in the freezing goddamn cold. And Billy still turned out to be somewhat affable. So this sin is for Bruce ending up as such a whiny bitch. These are completely different circumstances, though. Billy was abandoned by his mother, and Bruce's parents were killed in front of him. One is a much more traumatizing event, you douchebag. Landlines. Everything wrong with Shazam, ladies and gentlemen. Phones. We separate the sins from the eye, and he's just an old man. Hey, I get told something like that multiple times per day. What? I only make videos like two times a week. Are you making some like Big E evil guy's speech right now or something? You're like a mile away from me. Hilarious moment, honestly. But if that is doing this cliche monologuing, why isn't he any closer? Sinning this scene. <laughs> Still better than the actual movie. Yep. Seven realms are about to be ours. Man, DC's reboot of Jiminy Cricket is gritty as hell. Oh, uh, yeah. Ha 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 ha. Funny, funny, because not paying attention is hilarious. And when the next movie comes out, what? Who is this guy? He was never introduced in any movie ever. They say, if you want to tell a story right, you got to start at the beginning. Narrating. I have two problems with this sin. Firstly, the portmanteau narrating implies that narration and reading is bad. Narration in this case suggests that the movie is being told from Harley Quinn's perspective, which is important considering the name change of this film. That's the real sin here, that the film was marketed as a Birds of Prey movie, and it was basically anything but until the last 10 minutes. And second, reading is a good thing, considering Americans these days don't know how to spell, or write, or read aloud. So I threw myself into my work, became a psychiatrist. That's when I met him. So I guess when Harley went to Arkham to do a psych evaluation on Joker, they just let that asshole wear his purple suit? Come on, Mr. J. This is a cartoon meant to give the audience a visual representation of Harley and Joker's first meeting. The purple suit is there to give you Joker's iconic look, not to suggest that's what he was actually wearing in Arkham. I mean, are you forgetting that this universe's Joker has a big-ass damage tattoo on his forehead? Notice how it's not there right now? Mr. J, my Joker. You're gonna need to be more specific than Mr. J. That could be Jared, Jack, or even Joaquin. All we know is that it's not Heath, and leaving him off the ledger is certainly a sin. 
All right, that was clever. I'm gonna remove a sin for that. I take payment in kind. All hyena dealers are rapists. Yeah, but this isn't rape. He's just being creepy. I mean, sure, he's in her personal space, but he's clearly asking for consent here. This guy clearly sees Harley lunging at him, his mouth agape in surprise, but did the rest of his body not react to this? Wouldn't you almost involuntarily brace for the impact and not have your legs in such a vulnerable position? You see, it's really easy to say this when you play the scene in slow motion, but clearly she Bernard Pollard this guy pretty quickly. I mean, if moving body parts out of the way was as easy as you're suggesting, you'd never get a knockout in boxing or MMA. Call me dumb. I have a PhD, mother Weird, I don't remember Harley being this much of a potty mouth in Suicide Squad. Yeah, that's probably because Suicide Squad was rated PG-13 and this is a hard R. Or rated bad for me head holes if you're British. While Harley explains that being Joker's girlfriend lets her do anything she wants, I'm wondering why she has to steal this other woman's drink. Can't she just order one for free? Maybe it's not as much fun, but even though her arrangement is an abuse of power, this is an abuse of an abuse. Not only are you answering your own question here, you're also asking why a psychopathic killer criminal with carte blanche to do whatever she wants, steals things rather than order them. Are you... are you serious? Even when I did try and tell people, they didn't believe me. Except the conversation you are now overhearing isn't about them not believing that you broke up, it's about not believing you won't go running back to him. It may seem like a small distinction, except the movie wants to use the same point to both say people don't know what happened and that they do know but think she's powerless to stay that way. Those things are 100% contradictory. Except what you're doing here is removing Harley's words from their context. Previously, what she said was that she hadn't told everyone because she enjoyed the immunity being Joker's girlfriend gave her. Her words now are suggesting that when she did try to tell people, they either didn't believe her outright or they thought she would just go back to him. The entire point of the movie is Harley being emancipated from Joker, so this scene is trying to convey that Harley wants to be seen as independent because she's seen by people as Joker's lackey. Also, the symbolism of Harley blowing up Ace Chemical, the place where she and Joker officially began, isn't lost on me, but why couldn't this have been an Olive Garden? Okay, here's a bit of context. In a previous sin, Jeremy suggested that Olive Garden is a place where people break up. Some people have the Eiffel Tower or Olive Garden. Olive Garden is where you take people to break up. To me, that sounds like upper middle class yuppie bullshit because in 2020, people break up over text, but whatever. In that sin, it was revealed that Harley believed people's relationship began in Olive Garden or the Eiffel Tower, but that her and Joker's relationship began at the Ace Chemical Plant. So you see, Jeremy asking why couldn't this have been in Olive Garden is not only stupid, it contradicts his original point that Olive Garden is where people go to break up. Were there a bunch of black cats lying around at Ace Chemical? I'm fairly certain Jeremy's trying to make fun of this colorful explosion by saying it is the result of black cat fireworks, but does Jeremy not understand that there are chemicals in fireworks? You know, like sodium, strontium, barium, and copper? All things most likely to be found at a chemical plant? Based on 80s cop shows, she's always saying cheesy sh like there was only one shooter inside. Is one shooter inside cheesy? Seems like pretty straightforward cop describing the scene talk to me. It's not the line itself, it's the delivery. You know, the cheesy dramatic pause between the words shooter and inside. But of course you don't get why this is cheesy. When cheese is what you do for a living, cheese you become immune to. Have ballistics check for a bullet in one of those park cars. Did I stutter? I know this movie has a men treat women like trash theme and everything, but last time I checked, this is some clear insubordination. It still amazes me how you clearly answer yourself in a sin. If you know the theme of this film is women being undermined by their male counterparts, why are you shocked at the insubordination? Detective. Yeah. Found this necklace. And rather than following procedure and keeping it with other evidence, I wandered around with it until you showed up so you could put the pieces together fast and move quickly to the next scene. But she's the detective on the scene. I'm not a cop, but I'm pretty sure detectives are supposed to be told of all relevant evidence at a crime scene. Also, Harley threw that thing a metric mile away from Ace Chemical before she jumped out of the truck. What possessed this guy to snoop around there? Oh, I don't know. Probably the fact that when Ace blew up, quite a few of the surrounding buildings blew up as well. I'm not sure, but I think it's possible to have gained this information by actually watching the film. Is that a snot bubble? Ew. Gross. Oh, I've changed my mind. Peel it off. As if we needed any further evidence this guy was a psychopath. What exactly is the point in showing that the smallest thing can set him off when he just cut off people's faces? Again, you are answering yourself. The point is to show that the smallest thing can set him off. Okay, so Hyena Dealer's brother gets shot and he swerves the van into the other lane where there, there's another car coming, but when it cuts to the next shot, that car isn't there anymore and somehow the keys to my car just disappeared. While I do appreciate you attempting to be the CinemaSins of old and point out a continuity error, I have to say, you've strayed so far from your original purpose that you don't do it properly anymore. 
the car is actually in both shots. As you can see in the second shot, the Impala is on the side of the van. Actually, these taillights belong to the Chevrolet Cavalier. Thank you, Stan. I was getting to that. The reason I said CinemaSins isn't doing their job properly anymore is because the vehicle changed from an Impala to a Cavalier. That's the real sin, not that they forgot the car in the scene. I disagree. I think CinemaSins is right to state the car no longer exists. Changing from an Impala to a Cavalier is a reach. Well, why the hell do you think they would use two Chevy cars, both around the same year and both the exact same color? Because these shots were probably done over multiple days and they may not have had access to the other car on a different day and used a different car as a stand-in thinking people would notice. Fine. It was dumb luck, but still. That felt pretty great. Breaking the fourth wall with your narration and breaking the fourth wall by talking to the audience on screen are two different things. One can be done artfully, the other should usually be safe for Adam Sandler movies. What's weird about this is that you send narration in basically every movie that has featured it, implying that narration cannot be done artfully. And Deadpool would like a word with you, suggesting his claim to fame should be relegated to bad movies. Montoya's new shirt is awesome, but are we really saying that the shirt from Lost and Found that says I shaved my balls for this was any cleaner than what she was already wearing? Pretty funny to me that a YouTube channel that gets by pretending it's a comedy channel fails to recognize a gag in a comedic film. Movie continues to follow the anti-hero paint-by-numbers rulebook by downgrading Harley's violence. What about Harley Quinn's character makes us think that she would be using beanbags here instead of just taking on the precinct with a real shotgun? Sure, she likes the colors and glitter, but you can have both. First of all, this isn't a shotgun, it's a grenade launcher. And second, Harley and the Joker are well known for their use of gag weapons. What the hell do you mean, what is it about her character? Her name is Harley Quinn, a play on a Harlequin, which is an acrobatic comedic character in classic Italian theater. The whole point is to be silly. Sure, Canary can sing a glass to death, but what about all the other glasses in the room? A simple Google search could have answered this question. Sound can break a glass, but the sound has to match the resonance of the glass. As glass can have imperfections and differences in manufacturing quality, it's very much possible for one glass to break but not the others. Jesus Christ, does every dude suck in this movie except Sal the Sandwich Maker? Yeah, you know that's kind of the point with feminist movies. They tend to propagate the myth that all or most men are bad. You'd think with all the virtue signaling you do, you'd have noticed that by now. Why don't I own the crossbow guy? You should own him. I mean, I like crossbows. Who's going to tell you in that he transitioned from hilariously chewing the scenery to overperforming like he's a precocious seven-year-old hamming up lines in their grade school presentation of who owns the crossbow guy? <laughs> who wants to be the one to tell Jeremy that, uh, that's the f***ing point? Look at his little ears. His little haircut. Uh -huh. yeah, he's a thousand years old, and now wow. he's just an ornament in my living room. If this movie isn't careful, I just might start hating this guy. Hating Ewan McGregor. Cassandra somehow doesn't recognize one of the people who lives in her building, then claims she only makes money off white people. And does Canary somehow look white to you? First of all, Journey Smollett is white, or at least half white. Second, are you really asking if she looks white? I mean, blonde hair, fair skin? I'm pretty sure most people would mistake her for white from far away. I understand that we're supposed to believe that Cassandra is the pickiest pickpocket to ever pocket things picked out of pockets, but, but there is no way he's treating this cargo so casually he wouldn't notice her make this close-up move. In a previous sin, you stated that Zaz was dumb for pulling out the diamond in public. Criminals in general aren't very smart people, but goddamn, you're going to pull out a rock this important in broad daylight and admire it? But now you're saying that he wouldn't treat the diamond casually? You know, contradicting yourself in a span of a few seconds is a sign of not knowing what the f*** you're talking about. By the way, this is a Simone Biles level of gymnastics to make her real name fit the character name. I could buy Edward Nigma at least. You're sending this movie for the name that was created in the animated Batman series from the 90s. This character and the name Harleen Quinzel has existed for nearly 30 years. It's not a sin of this film. One of the grievances is voted for Bernie, and I'm just going to go out on a limb and say Harley Quinn did not bother voting in the Democratic primary in 2016. She was too busy being in jail and doing Suicide Squad The problem with this is that Harley wasn't in jail the entirety of 2016, as there's an undefined period of time before she was caught by Batman. She could have easily voted for Bernie during that time. Also, there are other things in here, like stole the remote and changed the channel, and I'm wondering, when did Harley Quinn have time to hang around Roman enough to do that? Did she spend a lot of time at his house? Considering the earlier scene where he was showing Harley respect, it's implied Joker and Black Mask had quite a few dealings with each other in the past. Naturally, this would put him into contact with Harley. Margot makes musical moment, manically mimicking Madonna's material, mocking Marilyn Monroe's masterpiece, and momentarily murdering movie's momentum. I'm gonna be real nitpicky here and say that the usage of the word and here ruins the alliteration you're trying to pull off. And in just a second, Harley will simply beat this machine to death and it'll give her access. I know we're watching a fantasy world, but does everything have to come so damn easy? Once again, Jeremy answers himself ex machina cliche. I know this is a solitary holding cell, but did they really put a 13-year-old kid in the same place as all these other criminals? The f not really a sin of the movie if this actually happens now, is it? 
Keep the kid alive! <laughs> Only in a movie does someone unload an entire automatic weapon in the direction of a target that they then say to keep alive. Okay, don't get mad, but this series is called Everything Wrong with CinemaSin, so I'm going to point out the editing mistake they made here, where the counter and timer disappear for a split second. For as ridiculous as it all is, the fight choreography and stunt work in this movie actually work really well. And when it seems like Marvel could learn something from DC... And let me stop you right there. The fight choreography in this movie is fantastic, some of the best in any DC film. But when you said Marvel could learn something from DC, that implies that this fight choreography is better than anything in Marvel. In that case, I see your Harley Quinn in Raze with the hallway scene in Daredevil. <laughs> And if that don't make your Jimmy shimmy, here's Bucky and Cap fighting Iron Man. This isn't going to change what happened. I don't care. He killed my mom. Cocaine power! It's apparent that Jeremy has never met a crackhead, because I'm fairly certain cocaine does give you superpowers. <laughs> Like violence. DC's marketing meeting memo somehow makes it into the film. <laughs> That's funny, coming from the guy that suggested Batman v Superman would outdo Civil War. No, we're not letting that go. One day she comes home to find her whole family in the living room. Is this the recreation of the Kaiser Soze story, verbal tells, and the usual suspects? Jeremy makes a pop culture ref. Now dance. If this movie isn't careful, I just might start hating this guy. Yes, Jeremy, because what the movie is trying to do is get you to like the antagonist that cuts people's faces off. Quit judging. He can't. He's a beaver. Damning things is in his DNA. Yep, that was clever. Removing another sin. So we've seen Black Mask to be a villainous scum without his mask on over and over again in this movie. So exactly what are we supposed to be feeling about him putting on the mask in this moment? It means exactly nothing to us. But the movie is treating it like somehow it's about to get real. When I'm just feeling like what's real is about to go to Wait, so are you campaigning for them to not make the character called Black Mask wear his mask? Are you one of those people that's okay with comic book characters not at all looking like their comic counterparts, like the absolute heathens that said it was okay for Hugh Jackman not to wear yellow? Because f you people. Did Montoya really come here armed only with her fists? She did see what Harley Quinn was capable of back at the police station, right? It's apparent that you didn't see what Harley was capable of because you clearly missed Harley taking out people with guns using only a bat, which is weird because you gave the movie a few sins specifically because that happened. Villain has tattoos or scars that show how many people they've killed, cliche. No, 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 no. This is Victor Zaz, a comic book character whose entire claim to fame is that he scars his body based on the amount of people he's killed. This is not a movie thing, it's a Zaz thing. If anything, this trope is based on him. I'm sorry, did they spray paint these guns while they were hanging here? I'm not sure which is more insulting, that you think this looks believable, or that you didn't think I'd be smart enough to get the joke without the obvious outlines. I'm pretty sure the movie thought you were smart enough to understand this weapons cache was here for a long time, and the dust and dirt buildup would cause these outlines. But alas, yet again, filmmakers have overestimated CinemaSense's capabilities. Holy shit, did this movie just turn into The Purge? Dude, you've used that joke so many times at this point, it's a goddamn cliche. Oh no, a mask must be The Purge! Seriously, keep this guy a million miles away from Doro Hedoro. No, seriously, keep him away from that anime. I don't need him talking shit about my baby Noi. Psh, your baby. I'll fight you for it. FB, you don't want no smoke. I got throat lozenges. So, we knew Canary had a powerful voice that could break glass, but in a movie that's filled with realistic fighting, this superpower just comes out of nowhere. This seems totally out of place. Uh, are you just unaware that this is a movie set in the DCEU? You know, the universe that's based on DC Comics? You know, the comic book company where every character is essentially a god? If you know this is Black Canary, then you should also know that in addition to being one of the best martial artists on DC Earth, she has a superpower in the form of a sonic scream. I can't tell you how stupid it is to suggest that a superpower seems out of place in a DC movie, while at the same time suggesting that 115 pound women beating the shit out of 200 pound men is in any way realistic. With me! What? With me! Okay! Fifty Shades of Prey? <sighs> Ew, and McGregor. <sighs> Roll Predators. 
motherfucker, do you not hear me sighing? because you were very old, Diana. Very, very old. So this really isn't that much of a surprise, is it? Here's the thing about long-lived species. They don't experience time in the same way that things that aren't as long-lived experience them. Think about it. Houseflies live for about a month. To them, that 28 days is a lifetime. But to a human, that was just last month, a period of time you probably remember very vividly. For someone like Diana, who's lived for hundreds of years, the period in which she was a child is roughly equivalent to two decades ago for us. A long time, to be clear, but not in the way you're suggesting. The stadium is gorgeous, but it seems fairly specific to this Themyscira and Olympics. What is its purpose for the rest of time? One-sided basketball court? Giant bubble blower? Quidditch field? To normal people, I probably don't even have to explain that this is like a basketball court or a baseball field, something that will remain in place until it's time to play the game. But this is CinemaSins we're talking about, so... I can't tell if these are actual competitions or just people doing a bunch of random stuff. And? I mean, what's your point? Again, it's obvious this is all for Amazonian athletics, so why is this a sin of the movie? How is this something wrong with the film? This is the most overcomplicated ball I've ever seen in my life. Well, we're waiting. Where do we draw the line on cheating? Why isn't pushing your competitor cheating? Why isn't this detour cheating? Damn it! If this is okay, I'm calling bullshit on penalizing Diana for taking a shortcut back to her horse later. I really don't understand you sometimes. Well, most of the time, but still. You're asking if the pushing is cheating while the movie is clearly showing you it isn't. It's like asking why is tackling legal in American football? Because it is. It's part of the game. These are some of the toughest beings on earth. What kind of pussies would they be if they could never shove each other around? And was this a sin for that later scene or are you going to double sin for the same thing? Either way, it's sinful as shit. There are six horses here when the competitors swim to the beach, but this race started with nine people. I know that they don't expect everyone to make it to this part, but what if seven or more racers got to the beach? And we get to the bows and arrows, there are seven there. And to make things even weirder, the target Diana hits has a color-coded system that tells the crowd who's winning, and there are only seven targets and seven spots for banners. It's almost like the movie expected there to be seven people in this race, but short changed the horses. And when it came time to film the start of the race, the director invited two more people to be in the movie. You correctly deduce that the organizers of the race do not expect everyone who started the race to make it to this point, but you miss something in the opening credits. It's shown there that there are many more than six horses on the beach, upwards to at least 12 horses. This, of course, nullifies this entire sin. I'm trying to suspend disbelief here, but I do not accept that Diana is out swimming and outrunning the other competitors. Even with her superior strength and ability, she just looks like a kid running. What do you expect her to look like when running? This? Because, uh... What a terrible event to attend. During the main event, people cheer, the lengthening of banners. They can't watch the race live, and they don't have a broadcast system. They watch banners unfurl. Yay! You're aware this is like the 11th century, right? I mean, there are blind spots when the audience cannot see on modern racetracks, notably the Nürburgring. Back in the early 1900s, the best the audience got was someone on the radio telling them what was going on. How is this any different from that? Someone is telling them who is in the lead using the banners and colored smoke. It's essentially the same thing. You took the short path. You cheated, Diana. That is the only truth, and truth is all there is. The short path? She clearly completed an extra obstacle that required ingenuity and strength. Five sins for gaslighting a child. I'll take those five sins and give them to you because she did take a short path by using a slide to cut through the course. Cheating always requires ingenuity. That doesn't make it right. You don't need a pile of money or some business degree to get started. You don't even have to work hard for it. America. Joke would have hit way harder if you said South Korea. This guy really walked into a mall jeweler for black market goods with no kind of face covering or mask. Well, yeah. SARS Cove 2 wouldn't be a thing for another 35 years. If you hate the contents of your purse enough to abandon them during fight or flight, maybe you don't need a purse. What the hell? This man has a goddamn gun. Your purse and its contents can be replaced. Your life cannot. How does Diana even know what's going on down here? The movie gives us the impression that she's already on route to the mall when she wonder boots this car out of the way. 
Maybe she's just lassoed truthing her way through the city like Spider-Man, waiting for plot convenient joggers in peril or dangling in fits. That is precisely what she's doing. Have you read a single comic book in your life? Pretty much every hero does this. Also, how did she manage to break through just the right skylight to rescue the little girl with perfect timing? This is a huge mall. It's almost like Wonder Woman has super speed or something. Wonder Woman fights in wedges. Wedges? The stupidest shoe ever created, and that's what she fights in? This woman is walking around in the same kind of shoes that people who have Can I Speak to the Manager hair wear. <laughs> We're supposed to let her save us? Jeremy just called Wonder Woman a Karen. That just doesn't sit right with me. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see you there. Hey, we can share if you like. Or you could have just given it to her. Jeremy yells at the screen cliche. Seriously though, Diana knew Steve Trevor for all of a month and she is still crisp pining for him after 70 years. I've had a longer relationship with the squirrel that keeps stealing my bird food. Ironically, he's also called Steve. F***ing Steve. I almost skipped this sin, but I wanted to point out that you're forgetting how old Diana is. She's over 800 years old in this movie and in the comics lives to be at least 5,000 years old. 70 years ago for her might as well be months for us. <laughs> One day movies will stop using clumsiness as a character trait for their female leads, but today is not that day. Yes, I know it's supposed to be a contrast to how dexterous Barbara is once she gets her superpowers, but damn it, that does not make it any less lazy. We get it, Jeremy. You've metamorphized into a male feminist. Problem is, women do tend to be clumsier than men because it is a component of physical ability, something men are naturally better at. So all this trope does is reflect reality, as shown by a study conducted in the UK. You should be reading papers like these instead of shit like this. Yes, the absolute f***ing bird brain that wrote this article believes she is clumsy because of the patriarchy. Feminism. Scientists don't wear heels. Sometimes we do. Also, a movie treats walking in heels as a virtue. No one is more or less valuable based on their footwear choices. They aren't treating heels as a virtue. They're literally saying that women have a choice. I see your brand of feminism is the one where you think women have to be frumpy in order to be a feminist. The entire point of feminism was to give women the power and space to choose. Okay, item number 23. Shoot, that's not it. Here it is. Here, Barbara is looking for item 23, but what she proclaims to be the correct item is actually item 24. A hilarious misunderstanding of the scene. She wasn't looking for item 23. She was reading the tag for item 23. That's why she held the inflection on the word number and released it on 23, because that's what reading sounds like. Item number 23. Shoot, that's not it. This guy is reading Waiting for Godot. It makes me wonder if it's a play on Gal Gadot's name as some sort of a fun Easter egg. Like maybe Patty Jenkins is always waiting for Gadot to get ready for her scenes or some sh well, The more I think about it, the more lonely and cold I feel. Like life is meaningless. Like somehow this is both clever and stupid at the same time. That really f***s me up. I was tempted to remove a sin for you finally pronouncing Gal's name correctly, which is something you didn't do in the video for the last movie, but then you kept going with this weird soliloquy. To be like Diana. Strong, sexy, cool, special. Barbara doesn't know that Diana has superpowers, so she could literally just be wishing to be strong, sexy, cool, and special, which are all subjective. And the movie works hard to push Barbara to this point, undermining her agency as a character. Her ultimate turn to villainy would serve more as a cautionary tale if it felt like this was an option. Instead, the writers have chosen to torture her to the point where even the audience is encouraging her to make this wish just because we want the pain to stop. Again, we get it. You are woke. Allow me to put you back to sleep. A character can be whatever the artist wants it to be. They are not real people. They do not have any agency. You know why? Because they are figments of someone's imagination. You and people like you are the reason media has become so trashed these days, trying to check off some imaginary checklist about what makes a character good enough. Barbara is undermined because that's the story the filmmakers wanted to tell. The crazy amount of BS in this awful movie and you want to talk about how badly a character in a fictional story was treated. Grow the hell up, Anita Sarkeesian. Have we met before? You look familiar. Do the thing. Do the thing. Life is good, but it can be better. Holy sh**, you're the Mandalorian. Yeah, but you just send the Mandalorian. We don't do that here. So Alistair was just left unattended in this hugely unsafe and poorly maintained office. There's like a billion hazards up in here. Either Raquel left him here in the first place, or she didn't call the CPS to report the mother who happily dropped him off in this crap heap. Did no one at CinemaSins get the memo that this movie was set in 1984, or...? You know what this movie doesn't have to do? Doesn't have to reduce men to panting horn dogs seconds away from dry humping a beautiful woman. And it doesn't need to make unwanted sexual attention. <sighs> oh my god. Skip! <laughs> 
<laughs> What's the game plan here, buddy? Kiss her so hard she loses her ability to notice you walking backwards through the door with your hands suspiciously behind your back, palming a gemstone the size of a horse's willy. Jeremy, if you think that's the size of a horse's willy, you have not seen a horse's willy. Also, Jeremy says boner. That's amazing. Good to know that old man Steve can still get a plain boner after 70 years. And this is the second Wonder Woman video Jeremy has used the term plain boner. Would you like to see my food on? Sure, when Chris Pine asks this, it's sexy. But when I ask this, I'm told to leave and they revoke my library card. He's great, but all I see is you. Audience is expected to accept this bullshit as reason enough for Diana to be okay with this possession of an innocent man's body. And is the person whose body he stole dead now? Is Wonder Woman the only person that can see him? I very nearly removed a sin for you recognizing that Diana is essentially raping the man whose body is being possessed by Trevor here, but then you went and ducked it up by asking, can people see the man? Jeremy, that was literally the point of showing that Trevor still sees the man in the mirror. The hell do you think is going on here? That Diana wished for an imaginary friend? Yeah, but we can't get you on one because you don't have a passport. Diana, you're Wonder Woman. You shouldn't need Steve to capture Max. That wasn't why she said that. It was in response to Steve asking and being excited about planes that can reach Egypt in one shot. Stop manipulating scenes, my dude. This shtick was old two years ago. I forgot to tell you. What? Radar. I can't explain now, but they'll see us anywhere, even in the dark. This invisible jet stunt just feels like pandering, and I will take off every last damn sin if Diana uses this insanely useful power again in this movie. What a waste of words. You know she's not going to use this ability again, so just say she never uses this power again instead of wasting everyone's time telling them you're going to remove sins. No, you're not. Approach. The aircraft has vanished. Do you have eyes on it? Whether you can see it or not, radar still bounces off metal objects. It's almost like the movie wants to make the jet invisible, non-existent, and operable all at once. This is the same magic that hides the mascara. Emphasis on the word magic. It not only makes the jet invisible, it renders radar useless against it. Otherwise, men would have found the mascara by now, right? I had an idea. Is it to stop flying through pretty sky bombs? Because I hope it's to stop purposely flying through pretty sky bombs. It's not like the fireworks will do much, if any, damage to the F-111. Heck, the real sin here is this jet seems to be going way too slow through these fireworks. There's no way they'd even have time to admire them. Flight, your gift. I'll never understand it. Is she saying she doesn't understand how planes fly? It may be pricey, but you can get a private pilot's license in a couple months if you want to. I am sending this because Diana is an intellectually curious person, and she had like 50 years to figure this out. What does someone being intellectually curious have to do with learning how planes work? Never mind the fact that she's an Amazon demigod whose culture is still somewhat stuck in the early days of human history. Most regular people don't know how planes work. Not only that, planes remind her of Trevor, and that being the case, she would have most likely avoided having anything to do with them. This is a weird sin. Who the hell just randomly decides to learn how to fly without having a prior interest? These stormtroopers put 20 rounds into the engine of this car because they're nice guys and the script asked them to. Also, why not just wait and see where Max is going rather than creating a massive dangerous situation on the roads? I know you want to stop him, like, right now, but whatever happened to intelligent, patient, apprehending of bad guys, especially when there isn't any imminent danger? Max is the villain of the movie, sure, but he wasn't some warmongering maniac with a private army at his disposal the day he left. You're saying this as if Trevor or Diana were the ones that started the shooting, or that they could have possibly known they were going to be shot at. Lasso of truth suddenly changes into a lasso of lies. I don't know, man. If this lasso can latch onto lightning, you know, something about 100 times faster than bullets, I feel like this is child's play. Also, the movie's about to say that the Dreamstone's price for getting Steve back is her powers, and yeah, she sort of loses them, but it's not enough to be like, holy sh she's a weakling now. And why is that a sin, exactly? Did the movie ever promise that she would be a weakling? I'm just curious where this idea is coming from, since the premise so far has been you lose something to gain something. If she loses some of her abilities, then she lost something. Seems like the sort of thing you would do before you turn into a damsel in distress needing to be saved by the big strong man. Ignoring the identity politics BS, Diana was sandwiched between two APCs in a way where she couldn't reach the wheel in order to do this. This being destroying the wheel, something Jeremy's editor cut out of context. When Steve pulled his APC between the others, it put the first at an angle that allowed Diana to actually reach the wheel. 
They try to create tension by making you think these kids are in danger, so Wonder Woman attempts an elaborate rescue plan in which she rides a rocket and swoops down to scoop up these kids. But she then ends up dropping them from like two stories and rolling over them several times. Then all the trucks were to avoid them. Were these kids ever in any real danger aside from the danger Wonder Woman put them in? First of all, Diana doesn't drop the kids. This is literally evident in the scene that you're showing. She drops with them, hits the ground first, and rolls in a way that protects the kids from most of the impact. Second, the part of the scene that you cut out shows that yes, the kids were absolutely in danger because at the very end of the scene, one of the APCs damn near runs them all over. This spot was way past where Wonder Woman picked them up. I said, but not now. How is it a secret if so many people saw? Jeremy thinks a secret isn't a secret if a few people know. If that's the case, explain literally anything that's classified in the US military. And I wish for your goodness. Again, with the whole ambiguity of this wishing scheme, does he have to take something from his son? Did his son lose something? It seems like he got to choose what he took from all the other people. Could you imagine the weight of this scene if we had to watch Max, bound by the rules of the stone, have to make this choice? But we did. Max loses his son and Alistair loses his father. How did you not get that? I told a man I wanted a farm. In what twisted world do two cows constitute a farm? The Luckstone is a dick to this guy. It's almost like that the magical MacGuffin stone was made by a naughty god whose wishes come at a cost and destroy civilization. The lasso does more than just make you tell the truth. It can make you see it too. This all seems like it's going to be important later, but maybe they could have used the previous hour and 40 minutes to introduce some of these pretty cool things. That would have been interesting to learn about more or maybe even see in action. I'm kind of confused by this then. What do you mean it would have been cool to see it in action? You mean like right now? What is the difference if they still show you anyway? I guess my point is Jeremy sends something he likes cliche. What's this? Global broadcast satellite. Top secret program that enables us to override any broadcast system in the world. I'm sorry, that was me throwing my bs meter out the window after it caught fire from listening to this bullshit. Movie wants to tell us that the exact bit of experimental tech that Maxwell needs to reach the world just so happens to be in the White House, being discussed at the exact time Maxwell wishes for this spontaneous meeting with the president. A few minutes ago, the president said he wasn't even here, so what? They just left this highly secret presentation out for the last however long? Either you're extremely dishonest or you're really dumb. You explicitly said that the president stated he wasn't in his office. This means that someone wished for the president to be here so Max could have an audience with him. This also means that the tech and discussion about that tech were wished here too. Nothing about this is convenient, my dude. You're watching a movie about wishes. Uses particle beam technology just like the Star Wars program. Oh, crap. Oh, you nearly got me. So what you're saying is they didn't do the thing that would cause you to give them a sin, but you're still giving them a sin anyway. Apparently it bays the landscape and a signal of particles that goes in and fiddles with any technology it touches. You said touches? He did, but not the way Max hopes. But the movie will make it mean that anyway. That's kind of what particles mean, Jeremy. Particles, in this case, refers to electromagnetic radiation. Radiation obviously touches people. This is why you can't go into Chernobyl, because ionizing radiation pierces through your organs and can cause radiation sickness or even cancer. I don't want to go into too much detail here, but believe me when I tell you that Diana's range of motion is limited by her useless booby armor. There's a lot wrong with this sentence, but I'll leave it at no, it's not limited, because it's flexible and by definition armor is not useless, especially in this case, where Diana is losing her invulnerability. Can't let you do this, Diana. Whoa, Nelly, how does Barbara know Wonder Woman is Diana? How did she see through her disguise? Yes, you're strong, but what did you lose, Barbara? Where's your warmth, your joy, your humanity? Diana asks this as if losing those things is in any way a punishment for wishing to be strong. Jeremy thinks losing one's humanity for power isn't a punishment. At this rate, I feel like the Dreamstone is real, and in return for his brain, Jeremy wished for subscribers. I'll never love again. If it means we don't have to see this bullshit in the next movie, I'm okay with that. If it means we get to see a strong woman in the lead who isn't crippled by love, I'm okay with that. God, they have reduced this powerhouse of a woman to a crumpling pile of emotional debris, haven't they? You see, this right here is the problem I have with Twitter feminism, which is the brand of feminism Jeremy obviously subscribes to. Instead of making women capable, intelligent, and resourceful, what these people want is for women to be men. This is why these people absolutely adore Brie Larson's Captain Marvel, because she appears to be an unfeeling, non-emotional automaton who balls up her fists with a constant scowl on her 
face. This is how people think men are. So in order for women to be like men, they want characters like these to not like men or even express emotions towards them. The problem is that men in these movies absolutely express emotion towards loved ones. Superman has Lois, Aquaman has Mira, Spider-Man has Mary Jane, etc. So my point is, if you want women to be equal to the men, Wonder Woman expressing her emotions for Steve is right on the money. Apparently her lasso can attach itself to the departing soul of her dead love, thus propelling her toward her destiny. It always cracks me up when I think about how you refer to yourself as hyper-observant. Someone who was actually hyper-observant would have noticed Diana grabbed onto this tower here, especially because you can clearly see that. But you only get one wish. But I, my dear, grant the wishes. This movie has followed the one wish per person rule from the very start. Now it says people can have another wish if they want because Max says so. Earlier he really wanted an aide to wish that he could visit the president, but because he already had used that wish on a Porsche, he couldn't use the aide the way he wanted. Now the movie says f*** that. No, the movie is still following its own internal logic. Since Max can take what he wants from those that he grants wishes to, he, Maxwell Lord, technically has infinite wishes. The point is that if he wants something, he can get it. This includes passing on a want to someone else. An apex predator. Like nothing there's ever been before. So definitely not a cheetah then? Also, cheetahs are not considered apex predators. At best, they're high-level mesopredators. Whoever taught you the word mesopredator? Because, let's be honest, didn't do a good job of explaining what that means. A cheetah is not a mesopredator. It is an apex predator. A mesopredator is an animal that hunts relatively small animals like rabbits or foxes. And while a cheetah would hunt those, they also go after zebras, wildebeest, and other megafauna in Africa. The reason they are an apex predator is because they are not actively hunted by other predators, which is what apex predator means. This doesn't mean they cannot be preyed upon, as lions are apex predators, but lions can still be killed and eaten by hyenas or even crocodiles. Hell, even great whites are killed and eaten by orcas. These relationships are complicated and depend on context, is what I'm saying. And I sure wish this works for me. Don't you? Yes, sir. How is this even a real wish? Pretty sure this guy's intention was just agreeing with a figure of speech. This isn't granting wishes, it's just granting casual suggestions. This is consistent with how the wishes have been granted the entire film, though. When Lord asked the president what he wanted, he never had to say, I wish, only describe his desire. As much as Diana hyped this armor, I don't understand why she needs it. Or at least why she thinks she needs it. She told Steve that her ancestor used it to protect herself from a huge army. But she's faced far worse than this, and the main bad guy isn't even all that physically dangerous, and she doesn't know Barbara turned into a cheetah yet. For a large portion of this video, you've been complaining about her losing her powers and even stated that her normal armor is pointless. Now when confronted with her donning actual full-body armor, your question is why is she wearing armor? Are you fucking serious? Scene does not include a Mungo Jerry. Jeremy makes a cat's pop culture <sighs> Over a decade of the modern superhero movie and we are still ending these things with basically a same versus same battle of punches and kicks that we know can't really do any damage to either character. I'm only curious, of course, but how would you suppose superhumans fight each other, Jeremy? No, seriously, what are you asking for? These characters don't have energy projection, so how else could they fight each other if not using arms and legs? And further, why do you keep asking for mismatches? A character fighting an otherwise evenly matched character is compelling, which is why we want to know who'd win, Cap or Batman. <laughs> the answer is Cap. And lastly, you are forgetting that these movies are based on comic books. These characters fight hand-to-hand -hand in those books, so it doesn't matter how long we've gotten modern superhero movies. If you're going into a modern superhero movie expecting no hand-to-hand -hand fighting, you're probably a f***ing idiot. Then I'm so sorry. The pandemic for robbing us all of the experience of hundreds of children screaming in terror as their hero straight up murders someone. Sure, sure, Barbara doesn't die, but- And let me stop you right there, because Barbara doesn't die. Make a wish! Any wish! I wish this movie would end. And I wish this video would end. Here, let me grant both our wishes. DC Comics.
It's got a nice bench, got lots of sunshine, has its little bouncy ball. This is more like daycare than prison. Since this type of solitary confinement exists in reality, you're going to have to explain why this is a sin of this film. Not to mention separating a non-problem child from other children in a daycare would get your daycare shut down. Fast. You know, considering this is a type of torture. Also, Folsom Prison Blues is playing, and the ball bouncing is super close to being on the beat of the song, but it's just off enough that it's driving me crazy! Everything wrong with The Suicide Squad. A character isn't bouncing a ball to the beat of a song. Michael Rooker appears in a James Gunn film cliche. Everything wrong with The Suicide Squad. An actor has worked with a director multiple times. Opening your movie with gratuitous abicide. Prison cafeteria ran out of apples? Another non-sin. A bad guy doing bad things is not a sin of a film, bruv. That's called characterization. This video did not need to be 17 minutes, and chaff like this is why it is. Seriously, why make more work for yourself when you could simply send the parts of the film that you have a real problem with and skip nonsense like this? Cool hero walk shot, but why is giant American flag? Must resist temptation to America. Turn around. Better. No. Yeah. Now you're safe. When the mutated weasel has a better understanding of how seatbelts work, you should really start to question your value on any team. Jeremy just indirectly sinned Dr. Alan Grant, and I have a problem with that. What does Savant do again? It's Brian Derlin. He's an expert in weapons and hand-to-hand -hand combat. Yeah. Thank you. Now that I know Savant is basically good with guns, I'm sure I will have no problem understanding what he brings to the team that is different from the likes of Deadshot, Deathstroke, Peacemaker, Rick Flag, Blackguard, Harley Quinn, and basically 90% of every Suicide Squad we've ever seen. As per usual, you just ignored the other thing the person lists as his ability hand-to-hand -hand combat. Besides, since when did the movie say they were all being recruited for specific abilities only? What kind of team are you putting together where abilities don't overlap? What if your sharpshooter gets taken out? Now you don't have a sharpshooter anymore. What are you okay. doing? Oh, uh, oh, uh, we're just hey, good hey, meeting everybody. everybody. Just, ready to go. just our normal, casual morning meeting. Did discount Nick Frost really need to come up with a cover for this? I seriously doubt that Waller gives a sh** about some office betting pool when she is the one sending the subjects of said pool to what is clearly advertised as almost certain death. What does that have to do with the support team clearly not taking their job seriously? Something that could threaten the mission? I mean, I understand that a bunch of clowns work at CinemaSins, but don't you want them taking the writing and editing seriously? Your name is Letters? Times the letters, dickhead. Boomerang would be amazing at CinemaSins. I almost never call out the would be amazing at CinemaSins gag, but this particular one made me think about how dumb it is. Essentially, someone in the movie makes a mistake, and then another person in the movie corrects them, and then Jeremy sends the movie for it. Shouldn't you take a sin off for the movie acknowledging the mistake the person made? I mean, at worst, it's a wash. American women all love accents. We do. Cause we don't got none. That's Texas. He says to a woman clearly sporting a Brooklyn accent, all Americans have accents. The language is called English for fuck's sake. Think about it. Did anyone check on where the weasel could swim? Regardless, how about somebody just gives him a hand anyway? But they do? Savant waits until he is fucking sinking before finally deciding to help the poor rat bastard. Oh, I see. You're being disingenuous with the scene here. Obviously, this is a comedy film and this scene is played for a joke. Weasel sinks very quickly as part of the gag here, meaning Savant saves him as soon as he could. Imagine a supposed comedy channel not recognizing comedy. Why is the Corto Maltese army only appearing on the screen now? This monitor seems to be hooked up to a UAV, but what's the point of sending it in after your team is already at the place that you are UAVing? It's almost like Waller knew all of this, and that this team was a distraction or something. Honestly, I'm not prepared to allow my brain to process this. Harley, take this one for me, will you? What the f What's the problem? This character exists in the comics as Arm Fall Off Kid or Splitter. I don't see an issue with a comic book film showing comic book characters as they are in the comics. Also sending Nathan Fillion for literally any reason. How's Team 2 holding up? Holy Double Cross Sneaky Team 2, Batman! Yes, the scene that refutes your UAV sin, and you're not only ignoring that it does that, you're randomly sending it for no reason at all. I don't think Batman would approve. 
Unless, of course, your name was Joker, then you can get away with anything. I am fully aware of how toxic some office workplaces can be, but this movie seems to be going to extreme lengths to make sure these people are as unlikable as possible. Celebrating their winnings is gross, but I can kind of see it. But why is this guy flipping off the pictures of the deceased as well? Why, movie? Why do you want me to hate these people? Especially since they end up saving the day at the end of the movie. You're aware of the kind of people that are in the Suicide Squad, right? The guy in the chair is flipping off Weasel, a character that was stated to have killed 27 children. Fuck Weasel, is what I'm saying. And with this bird vengeance, I present to you the only thing that comes close to a fully realized story arc. Are you suggesting the plot of this film doesn't have a fully realized character arc? Because that would be about as true as anything on Kylie Jenner's body. Never forget, this is what she actually looks like. Is he the only guy cleaning this entire prison? <sighs> no, but he's the one they're currently showing you. Jesus, what are you, eight? Who's gonna kill his kid? And so begins the apparent redemption of the most f***ed up office team since Dunder Mifflin opened its doors in 2005. But why are Waller's tactics so shocking to him? He's been here long enough to be betting on which Z-list DC character dies or survives each mission, but the fact that Waller would use a child to blackmail an inmate onto the team is somehow shocking to him? She's f***ing playing the hits right now! You're completely misunderstanding the point here. You have positioned this as these guys who are betting on the deaths of horrible people shouldn't be shocked that innocent people are being dragged into this. I feel like I shouldn't have to explain this, but threatening harm to otherwise innocent people is nowhere near the same as taking pleasure in horrible people dying. Are you having a laugh? What? You just said each member of the team is chosen for their unique abilities. He does exactly what I do. Bloodsport would be dead shot at CinemaSins. Ignoring the fact that Waller has Peacemaker on the team to carry out a covert plan, again, I go back to the purpose of this gag. If the movie is calling this out, how is it a sin of the movie? Also, I think you're failing to get that this is the joke. Comedy movie. Paul Rudd. Uh, okay, not really, but you know what I mean. Does Ratcatcher 2 keep her orange juice at room temperature? Yes. You know, because this is a prison and it isn't meant to be comfortable and accommodating. And that's not orange juice, that's Sunny Delight, the white person's purple drink. Why would you do your big mission presentation in such a way that the Deep Reefer shadow blocks part of the presentation image? Just take some of the money from the prison's giant American flag fund and put it into better projector setup. Probably when that shadow literally blocks nothing important on the screen. See, what you did was only show this slide of the presentation, which is an obvious manipulation because Waller almost immediately skips to the next slide and then ends up on the opposite side. The country has been ruled with an iron fist. Hey, that's a Marvel property. Don't you need permission to use him? Your mission is to infiltrate Jotunheim. Of all the names and all the collected history of humanity, why did the writers pick Jotunheim? It's as if they thought, hmm, everyone loves those Thor movies. Maybe we could steal some goodwill via osmosis. No, it's actually as if Jotunheim is something that exists in the comics. This man actually thinks Norse mythology was an MCU invention. Well, you know what I think? I think liberty's just your excuse to do whatever you want. America. Oh, fine. It's cool when the British guy says it, but when I said the exact same thing in college, skip. Oh, and that guy is German, not British. But yeah, skip. The titty monkey, sometimes called the titty monkey by ignorant Americans with a fondness for breasts, are vocal. Skip. Actually, you shouldn't have skipped this scene because Jeremy makes the point that the titty monkey lives in the Amazon and that this movie doesn't take place in the Amazon. Actually, my skip was justified because TDs don't just live in the Amazon as they can be found as far south as Paraguay. TDs are best described as living in South America. And where does this movie take place again? Exactly. In my admittedly dated experience of slumber parties, I always found it was a good idea to expel one's polka dots before settling in for bed, especially in mixed company. That's racist. Also, Jeremy says boner. Okay, let's talk about this sequence of events here. Let's not. I know friends. Same to Nawe. Same. Jeremy sends something he likes, cliche? If I die because I gambled on love, it will be a worthy death. But you'll never know one way or the other because you'll be dead. 
Her point is that she would be content with dying if her death was a result of love. But do me a favor. Point out where she said what you said. If you can't, it's because you're just making shit up. Oh my god, I'm good at my job. <laughs> I found him. Seems more like the computer found him, or the satellite. You were literally leaning back drinking a soda, so I don't know how you did anything. Tell me, do computers and satellites just do things on their own without having been programmed to do so by a human? Because that would be the singularity and we would all be fucked. How? How? How are these two chuckle fucks still standing around as if none of this excessive blood sporting and peacekeeping was happening mere feet behind them? And these assholes too? Sweet galloping plot conveniences. Did Waller set the difficulty on this mission to off? Sorry to be so pedantic here. <laughs> oh, who am I kidding? Not really. But you can't set difficulty to off. Difficulty is a spectrum and anything outside of that spectrum is non-participation. And they're clearly participating. <laughs> Man, this guy's got lungs. I haven't seen someone blow this hard since Jamarcus Russell. <laughs> you clearly haven't seen Jill Scott on that one microphone. Uh, oh, you you meant uh, the other thing. Sorry, I got confused. There are three definitions going on right now. Why did my people not alert me of your arrival? Why does Radio Shack ask for your phone number when you buy batteries? Make a deal with the devil to stop them. People who say this are really underestimating the devil. Trust me. That's okay, because the devil doesn't exist. Trust me. Project Starfish. And the hot dog flavor water? Lamp Biscuit. If the previous regime was at least not directly offensive to the American government, but this new regime the U.S. hates, how is there a turkey on this table? Does the South American island of Corto Maltese have native fucking goddamn turkeys? Because I don't damn think they do. Listen, I can understand if this was the early 20th century, but you're talking about a film that takes place in the 2020s. Imported food is completely normal these days, especially in the context of the rich and powerful. You can literally buy turkey in Japan year round. This is a stupid sin. Is this all the same day? Yes. Leaving your pistol unsheathed during cordis. Yeah, but condoms suck. My dad told me that. You use a condom? No. Good! That's my boy! That's my boy! Yo, never use condoms, son. They take away all the feeling. Nazis. Came here, seeking asylum after World War II. I swear if you counted up the total number of leftover Nazi scientists that are out and about doing sketchy sh in every movie and TV show since 1945, you wouldn't be able to go to a fucking Walmart without bumping into one of those bastards reverse engineering Twinkies to travel back in time to poison Churchill. Wait. Hello, Netflix. Yes, Jeremy, we got your messages about this the first 30 times. It's a stupid idea. Stop calling here. Damn. Damn? You nailed it? But she didn't nail it. What she was actually trying to do was this. Why are you so afraid of rats? The plague, mostly. Jeremy yells at the screen cliche. We lived almost in the streets of- Skip! State considered the rats a weapon. I don't think I can fault the state here. You have already used the rats as a weapon in the last couple days, so why the tears? Probably because the part you skipped explained that her father died and she was arrested for using rats to survive. In other words, she became an orphan and is not a murderous criminal like everyone else here. That is sad, no matter how you cut it. You remind me of my daughter. F*** you, dude. You made it clear in the earlier scene that you barely knew your daughter. No, the only thing he made clear was that he was a terrible father, not that he barely knew his daughter. Besides, even if he didn't, it's almost like he... barely knows Ratcatcher. John Cena dancing. What? Where? This is one of the most disturbing scenes ever filmed. Like, will YouTube's content filter even let us post this? Is this suitable for advertisers? Sinning this scene. You're torturing Harley Quinn? They all seem to know who she was by name, but if they're tasering her to get her to talk, they don't know shit about Harley Quinn. Says the guy who definitely doesn't know shit about Harley Quinn. Considering the last movie you sent that featured Harley Quinn, you didn't even know her name was Harleen Quinzel. This is the second movie to feature her being tortured, and in Birds of Prey, she broke after being bitch slapped once. I mean twice. Don't leave one of our own behind. Yes, you fucking do. That's the whole point of the damn team, or else it would be called the Leave No Person Behind Squad. Jeremy thinks the opposite of leaving teammates behind is suicide. Playing emoji charades at work. I think you've been a YouTuber for far too long. This is literally how regular people keep from killing themselves at their jobs. I mean, if you're gonna be strangled to death. Jeremy sends something he likes cliche. Much has been made about how Margot Robbie apparently did this using your foot to unlock the chain scene herself, which is admittedly cool as f but I'd have given all the sins back if she got that key into the lock, only to learn it's not the key to her chains, but some random other key, like the dude's locker at the gym. So, 
you liked what the movie did, but because they didn't do something stupid, you're going to sin it? Does that make sense to anyone? Okay, yeah, you're probably not supposed to be gambling on company time, but I still think- Holy f that handgun is pointed directly at this card playing fellow on the left. Just like the single digit IQ sporting geniuses that didn't understand what I was saying about the gun's tombstone was pointing in my Enter the Spider-Verse video, you're failing to understand perspective. That gun is not pointing directly at the guy on the left because as you can see, it's on the edge of the table and the guy on the left is in the middle of that table. What are you, 2D? <laughs> No one will be seated during the John Wick Harley Bellum portion of the movie. Oh look, a character that has been established as a capable hand-to-hand -hand fighter in two previous movies is totally ripping off John Wick because John Wick invented combat. Come on without, come on with him. You'll not see nothing like the fight Quinn. Jeremy sings in a video cliche. The director said, please be sure to stare directly into Cinema Sin's soul while taking a bite of this apple so he knows how big of an asshole he is. Jeremy sins himself, but still gives the sin to the movie. Okay, Milton is here with them right now as they enter. King Shark is even behind him. Flag and Polka are abreast of him. The movie makes a big joke soon about how no one knows who he is. Oh, I thought there was more to this. What you're saying is a comedy movie sets up and makes a joke and this is somehow sinful? Is it because you think comedy is having a room full of writers that are all bad at watching movies? Like how all nine of you missed that only Harley was the one who forgot Milton? And put the emergency code. Now! Why would they have given the emergency front door lock code to the scientist working on experiments inside the building? This is a military run facility. <laughs> this is why I clown CinemaSense for having multiple people that write and edit these videos, but somehow all of them miss critical elements of these movies. Earlier, Waller explained that Jotunheim was a scientific facility and that the Thinker was in charge of what went on there. Part of their plan was making contact with the Thinker specifically because he has the codes to this facility. How are we supposed to get in? Gaius Greaves, the Thinker is a geneticist in charge of Project Starfish. Get Greaves to help you by whatever means necessary, and he can get you into Jotunheim. You were too busy worrying about f***ing shadows, so you missed that part of the presentation. If God existed, wouldn't this be proof that he wasn't good at all? Well, no, actually. God's goodness, at least biblically speaking, from a New Testament perspective, is not something that prevents all human suffering, but rather something that offers grace and redemption to all those who have suffered. But that skirts the fact that this hypothetical God created everything, including the concept of suffering, and that he knew the people he created would suffer, thereby making him the direct cause of suffering. That's the problem with primitive fairy tales. They fail at logic and can't keep up with societal morality. Imagine believing an all-powerful deity needs to send an avatar of himself to Earth with the intention of dying to forgive forgive sins instead of just forgiving the sins that he knew was going to happen anyway. Flag pulls out a single hard drive and a wall of rack computers and servers and somehow decides it's the one he's after. And it appears he's right. Nice scene manipulation, bro. In the part you didn't show, Flag does try to open the other servers. Heck, you can literally see one of them open next to the one that contains the hard drive. 30 years of what we are led to believe is agonizing torture and Space Patrick kills the thinker guy this quickly? Damn it, where's my tentacle-based revenge? This, coming from the guy that sends villains for meandering and monologuing, is hilarious. <laughs> oh, oh. Like I give a sh Not being sad that Nanawe gets hurt. That's worth these many sins. I know we all love King Shark, but the amount of bullets being unloaded into him is enough to take down a tank, let alone a super strong sea animal. Besides the fact that, no, this is not nearly enough ammo to take out a tank, King Shark is a literal god. I mean, the movie is showing you he can tank those shots, but here you are suggesting he can't based on what exactly? Some bullshit. I suppose the human-looking alien from a planet called Krypton who can fly and shoot laser beams from his eyes didn't tip you off, but this is a comic book universe. You got a dude vomiting polka dots. This is the least bullshit thing in this movie. I know this would be quite the anticlimax, but why does Cornell not tell his people to immediately open fire on the discount not so expendables? As far as he knows, they're just running from a collapsing building. This is wrong. What the movie actually shows is the army reacting to giant tremors coming from the already collapsed building before they run out, suggesting that something big is causing it. Considering Mateo already knows about Starro, do I even need to finish this sentence? The last starfighter here steals the face-hugging technique from the Alien franchise, and I am not okay with adding this to my very specific list of face-impregnating night terrors. Except Starro has existed in the comics since 1960, and the Alien franchise began in 1978, 18 years later. 
straight up murder. The word you're looking for is war. These guys performed a military coup against the original government that was in place. You would have known this if you weren't so enamored with shadows. Listen to me, people. Do yourself a favor and never, ever Google the phrase armpit ejaculate. Let my pain be enough to cover us all. But you realize that isn't Starro's armpit. He's a starfish. That was his crotch. Still better than the Rampage movie. Jeremy sends something he likes, cliche. I knew Sebastian sensed good in you for a reason. I'm sorry. This is nitpicky even for me, but skip. What in the nanotech fury is this bullshit? the extra dimensional gun that allowed Bloodsport to put a bullet in Superman. Comic book movie. Honey, take the high ground. What? She has a spear. You have guns and grenades and arrows and all kinds of shit. Why is she taking the high ground? I mean, yeah, it works out that she jump stabs the Starro thing in the eyeball, but he didn't know that when he gave this order. This is a terrible order. But you've answered yourself. He ordered Harley to take the high ground because he knew she'd be able to pierce the higher than ground level eyeball with Javelin's Javelin. Ah, oh, you may be tempted to marvel at the underwater gracefulness of Harley and the rats. I'm here to remind you that this is not water. It's eyeball juice. I'm curious, but what do you think makes up eyeball juice? Taking your preteen daughter up to deadly heights just to teach a lesson about purpose. Also, how the f*** did they even get up there? They're not Batman. But they are Ratman. And if my playthrough of A Plague Tale has taught me anything, it's that rat powers are better than no bat powers.